In this video, I'm going to look at the bond that forms when two non-metals join together, and that is known as covalent bonding. And remember, the bond that's formed between a metal and a non-metal is ionic bonding. So this is going to be different to ionic. So we'll start with the simplest covalent bond, and that's the bond that we see um, in hydrogen. So there's a hydrogen atom drawn up on the whiteboard with its one electron. That's it. It's all it's got. It's got a proton and a nucleus and that electron in that first shell there. So if you remember from ionic bonding, the aim of the atoms was to uh, become stable. And the way they did that was they either lost or gained electrons to end up with a full outer shell. Um, so what's hydrogen going to do? Well, if I draw another hydrogen up here, so we've got two identical atoms there. The easiest thing for this, these two atoms to do is to share this pair of electrons here. So this hydrogen is going to share this dot and this hydrogen is going to share this cross. And they do that by overlapping this outer shell. So there you can see now drawn up the overlap and we've got this pair of electrons here. Um, so the hydrogen on the left now, because it's sharing this electron from the right, it's got two electrons in its outer shell. So that's the, that's the stable situation for the first shell. And the one on the right, well that's doing exactly the same thing. So what's holding the atoms together, you can see I've changed the centre of the atoms now to a plus sign. And that's because the nucleus is positively charged. It's got protons and neutrons in there. Protons are positively charged, neutrons don't have any charge. And so this negative pair of electrons is going to be attracted to the nucleus. And so is this one. And so this attraction is what's holding the atoms together. So you can see I've written up the definition now. The covalent bond is the attraction between a nucleus and a shared pair of electrons. So that's why the formula of hydrogen, the element is H2. And another way you could draw that would be H, solid single line H, and that solid line there represents the, a single covalent bond. We'll look at another example now. I've drawn up the uh, CH4 formula. That's methane. So that's the molecule in natural gas. And um, we're going to draw the dot and cross diagram for the methane molecule. Um, what kind of bonding will we have between the atoms? We've got non-metal, non-metal. Remember, the bond between non-metals is the covalent bond. So there's the dot and cross diagram there. And just like I did with the ionic dot and cross diagrams, I'm only showing the outer shell. So we've got these, the central carbon atom with its four electrons in its outer shell. So we'll say that they're the dots. So four dots because carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. Each hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell, so that's the cross. So you can see if they share the electrons in this way, then both of the atoms, the hydrogen and the carbon, will have full outer shells. Carbon, well, it needs eight electrons to fill its outer shell. The hydrogen only needs two, so you can see how that's been achieved as well. And there's another representation for the methane molecule showing the single covalent bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen atom. I just want to look at this example because it's going to bring into play a new um, feature, which is obviously this bit here. So NH3 is the ammonia molecule, non-metal, non-metal, so covalent bonding. Nitrogen's in group 5, so you can see I've got 5 dots one two three four five 
obviously the hydrogen just has its one electron so you can see there that the nitrogen by sharing these three unpaired electrons we've got two four six eight so that satisfies the um, the full outer shell so what's special about this well this is a pair of electrons that's not involved in bonding and this is known as a lone pair and I've just marked up as well there that a pair of electrons that is involved in a bond so there's a, that's obviously a bond there between the hydrogen and the nitrogen this is known as a bonding pair so you might sometimes see ammonia drawn like this so there's your three single covalent bonds and that double dot there represents this lone pair of electrons we'll look at some that appear to be odd ones out now so I'm calling this odd ones out seemingly so we've got BF3 boron trifluoride two non-metals so it's got to be covalent there's the dot and cross diagram um, so fluorines in group seven so we've got seven crosses borons in group three so three dots so what's the seemingly odd thing about this well it's because boron hasn't got eight electrons in that outer shell it's only got six so you might think well that's not really going to be stable is it well it is because as long as the as long as this central atom maximizes its um, the number of possible covalent bonds so because boron's in group three it can only form three covalent bonds then it's stable like that so okay it's not eight electrons in that shell but that is stable like that so if we look at this one now this is pcl5 phosphorus pentachloride so why would this look like it's an odd one out well it's obviously got two four six eight ten electrons in the outer shell so that's more than eight now how can that be possible what it's known as is expanding the octet so in other words going beyond the eight electrons so how is it possible for phosphorus to expand its octet well the key to this is the fact that phosphorus is in period three of the periodic table and what we need to know or we need to appreciate is that the third shell the third electron shell can hold 18 electrons now with GCSE most teachers would say two in the first shell eight in the rest well I'm afraid that's not actually true so the third shell can hold 18 electrons well that explains how phosphorus can do that if you want to know a bit more about what's happening there at the end of the video I'll put on um, what actually goes on you don't need to know it for a level but if you are interested then you might want to watch that now as well as single covalent bonds we can have multiple covalent bonds as well so I'm going to use oxygen O2 um, to illustrate one of these multiple bonds so we know that the bond between these two non-metals these two oxygen atoms has got to be covalent so let's just think about two oxygens so oxygens in group six so we'll put one pair of electrons in there so this one's going to have five left one two three four five and this one is also one two three four five there's the symbol so you can see that that situation doesn't um, help us out because each oxygen has only got one two three four five six seven whereas it wants eight so obviously what must happen is if the spare electron the odd electron the unpaired electron if that feeds into the overlap as well and we end up with this situation you can see that this actually sorts out the problem so we've still just got six electrons six crosses two four six two four six dots so we haven't changed the total number of electrons but by sharing two pairs of electrons each we've solved the problem
so 2468 2468 so that's stable like that so what do we call this covalent bond it's called a double covalent bond so that's obviously two shared pairs of electrons and you might sometimes see an oxygen molecule drawn like this so that double line there represents the double covalent bond and the bond between the two nitrogen atoms in the N2 molecule is actually what we call a triple covalent bond so you can see three shared pairs of electrons now in this overlap you can see also that each nitrogen has got its five outer electrons one two three four five one two three four five so the electron count is correct but to get the stability we need to share three pairs of electrons so we've got this very very strong triple bond between two nitrogen atoms and that explains why nitrogen is so unreactive it makes up nearly four-fifths of the air in the atmosphere um, and it's because of the high stability the strength of this triple covalent bond well, I did say I'd go back to explaining the PCL5 situation so here it is so if you remember in the phosphorus atom we have five outer electrons but remember they're in the third electron shell and I did say that the third electron shell can actually hold 18 electrons so why is that the case well shells are made from subshells so this is a 3d subshell this is the 3p subshell and this is what we call the 3s subshell and you can see that this subshell is made from five individual boxes these boxes refer to orbitals so we've got five orbitals in the 3d subshell three orbitals make up the 3p subshell and one orbital makes up the s the 3s subshell so at the moment those five outer electrons are going to occupy the lowest energy subshells at first so we have two electrons in the 3s subshell and that leaves three so we have one two three so hopefully you can see what's happened there the one of these 3s electrons has been promoted up in energy into a 3d orbital and what we've created are the known as hybrid orbitals because they're kind of a mixture of the different types of orbitals but you can see now we've got one two three four five unpaired electrons now and so we can pair these up and form covalent bonds um, with the five electrons from the those five chlorine atoms so this hybridization has created these five new orbitals so they're known as sp3d hybrid orbitals because they're made from 1s orbital the 3p orbitals and this one of the 3d orbitals so one of those three of those one of those sp3d hybrids like I said, you don't need to know this for A-level, so don't worry about it. But if you are interested, then hopefully that's kind of uh, um, satisfied your thirst for knowledge.